Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Exporting Cosmetics to China, Understanding the Market and Its Stakes. I'm uh, David Orlandi, EU Partnership Coordinator for US Semi Center, and I will be uh, guiding you throughout today's uh, webinar. Before moving to the uh, presentation of the speaker and the agenda, I would like, first of all, to uh, say a warm, a wholeheartedly felt thank you to the Embassy of the Republic of Poland in Beijing, uh, the Polish Investment and Trade Agency, the Polish Union of the Cosmetic Industry, to open and the Italy China Council Foundation for making this uh, uh, webinar possible. I am sure I do not have to dwell too much on the uh, relevance of the Chinese market as a, potential, uh, as a potential market for export for cosmetics. But despite of these, uh, the specificities of this market make it so that it might seem daunting, especially to small and medium enterprises that want to export towards China. To this end, uh, we have decided to organize this webinar in which we will try to provide, first of all, a general understanding of the Chinese market, and then focus uh, also on the technical issues that European enterprises face when exporting towards China. Uh, as you can see, the agenda for today is uh, very intense. Uh, after uh, the welcoming words uh, that will be provided by myself, uh, Monika Kolpaczynska from the Polish Investment and Trade Agency and uh, Blanka Szmurczynska Brown from the Polish Union of the Cosmetic Industry. We will have a general introduction by Arvid Tilner of the USME Center, and then a specific focus, as I was mentioning, on the various technical issues of the Chinese cosmetics market, uh, provided by uh, Jun Huang from the uh, Two Open, then uh, Ms. Maria Galandezano and Ms. Uh, Mr. Luis Galandezano. Uh, at the end of the presentations, we will have a Q&A session, so uh, hopefully we will have picked your interest and there will be uh, the possibility of exchanging uh, questions and opinions with our speakers. Uh, prior to moving to the main phase of this, uh, of this event, I would just like to spend a quick couple of words about USME Center and its mission. Uh, USME Center is an initiative funded by the European Union, whose goal is to support small and medium enterprises that want to enter or expand in, in the Chinese market. It has been launched in 2000, 2010, and it's already in its uh, 13th year of, uh, uh, of life. Uh, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, it is implemented by six partners, four consortium partners and two associated partners. And as I was mentioning, the uh, main goal is that of supporting European SMEs. In order to do so, five services, uh, five main services are provided uh, to these entities. First, there's a self-diagnosis tool that's available on our website uh, and that SMEs can directly access in order to gain an understanding of their preparedness for the Chinese market. There's the possibility to access a database of market reports, guidelines, and case studies uh, one of which we are actually going to analyze today. Uh, they are all free of charge on the services and all the reports that are included in the, uh, in the website. Then there is the possibility to directly ask uh, questions to the experts based in Beijing that the USME Center provides to the enterprises. The possibility of organizing trainings, conferences, and webinars, such as the one that we are organizing today, and then the possibility of providing a uh, coherent voice for enterprises that are in the Chinese market and then need a venue to make their voice heard. So without further ado, uh, I would like to move forward with the, with the event. And then I leave the floor to uh, Ms. Kolpaczynska from the Polish uh, Investment and Trade Agency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is uh, Monika Kopaczynska, and I am Business Development Manager at Polish Investment and Trade Agency, a representative office in Shanghai. Uh, I am very happy to be able to participate in this event, and I'm going to make a short introduction uh, from our side. So first of all, who are we? Polish Investment and Trade Agency is an institution operating in the business environment. It's a modern global organization whose activities work to build the recognition of Poland in the world as an attractive business partner. Uh, we are also a leader in export and investment consultancy, 
We offer comprehensive services for companies combining industry competencies and international experience. Our mission is basically to develop and promote a Polish economy. We are an institution operating in the business environment within the Polish uh, Development Fund, a group of financial and advisory institutions. Our basic areas include export, investment and partnership and promotion. So we support the international expansion of Polish companies. We support Polish export, uh, especially uh, small and medium uh, enterprises. We also support investments in Poland and uh, in Poland and abroad. We support uh, for foreign direct investments in Poland, and we also cooperate with public administration and business environment institutions in the various uh, projects. In terms of support we provide for exporters, we do analysis of export potential, we prepare information packages, organize B2B meetings, business missions, prepare a list of possible business partners, and we also verify business partners and more. And if it's about support for prospective investors, we do location uh, consulting, uh, organization of site visits, prepare information about different forms of public funding, uh, identification of potential business partners and suppliers, also introduction to startups and technology providers, uh, organizing B2B meetings and so on. We operate in many markets around the world, creating the network of foreign trade offices and on these markets, our trade offices are familiar with uh, knowledge of local specifics, uh, culture and business conditions of local languages, and also key industries in individual markets. And in China, uh, our representative office is located in Shanghai. And a few words about the upcoming events. We plan to be present at China Beauty Expo, very important event event for the cosmetic industry, which will take place on May 12, 14 in Shanghai, a great opportunity for Polish producers to establish new business relationships and contacts with foreign uh, and Chinese companies and distributors. And to learn more about uh, upcoming events, we encourage you to uh, visit our website, especially the page with the recommended events um, like, for example, for now, we just only can mention about um, the event which will be after China Beauty Expo, which is Ningbo China CEC Expo and International Consumer Goods Fair, also for co cosmetic industry, uh, which will take place this year, uh, May 16, 20 in Ningbo. And of course, if you have more questions, our team in Shanghai and our team in Warsaw uh, also is ready to help. So this is our contact information. Don't hesitate to contact uh, us if you have any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this introduction, for this presentation. I would like now to leave the floor to uh, Ms. Chmuzinka Brown from the Polish Union of the Cosmetics Industry. Thank you very much. Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope we are um, very well heard and visible for all of you around Europe. Although um, as, uh, as we uh, observe the registration numbers growing, I have to say that majority of the participants of today event are Polish entrepreneurs, small, small and medium companies, but not only. But this way or another, I would like to welcome all of you and, um, and just say that this meeting or this webinar is possible and is taking place thanks to the group of allies that set up uh, months ago, the idea of creating this, uh, um, uh, this webinar, this conference. And I have to thank first and foremost, uh, EU SME Center, um, 
to open China, um, um, the, the organization that is actually um, leading the, the, the technical and regulatory discussions at today's webinar. Um, and to open China e-commerce and business solutions with Maria Galan Lozano, with Louis Galan Lozano, and Jun Huang, I would like to thank you for participating in this webinar because without your, without your uh, attendance, probably the shape of this webinar wouldn't be uh, possible to, to create it in the way uh, it's set up today. But obviously it has to be also stressed that we have our Polish diplomatic allies that help, help us to, to set the event and to organize it well. And I have to thank the Polish uh, embassy uh, and uh, especially Mr. Krzysztof Florczyk, without whom this uh, meeting probably wouldn't have this kind of uh, organization scheme. And I have to thank as well straight away calling our previous activities that thanks to the Polish embassy, the Polish entrepreneurs two years ago, and thanks to our cooperation, managed to get the GMP certification for Chinese market. And thanks to these people far away um, uh, from us, from Warsaw, uh, really help us set up um, um, this kind of documentation, which is necessary for Polish entrepreneurs to uh, sell to export cosmetics to China. Um, so thank you all for putting our efforts and hands and heads together to create this, um, um, this webinar, but I would like to also take the opportunity and thank uh, my own members, Polish Union of Cosmetic Industry mem members, 250 companies, who actually helped us by asking questions and putting the questions forth. They uh, allow uh, Maria Galan Lozano and her team uh, allow to uh, shape well the agenda of the webinar to prepare uh, to answer the questions that were um, placed before. So I would like to really thank my membership and Justyna Żarańska for coordination of gathering of all this information because it only uh, makes us precise and answering this kind of questions or this kind of worries that you might have uh, in Europe and especially in Poland. Of course, these questions coming from Polish SMEs will probably be very much the same as the, the questions coming up from the Spanish SMEs uh, or Italian or any other operating in Europe. So in this way, we managed to get a good uh, agenda. What else I would like to highlight is that we have a special collision of very many dates, which actually put this webinar in a special focus and gives the extraordinary attention. First of all, two years ago, CSAR, Cosmetic Supervision and Administration Regulation has been published, came to force together with all other documents or regulation which support that. Um, on top of that, so we are two years away from 1st of January, 2021. This is an important data, why? Because for the last 1,016 days to be precise, so for almost three years, the entire Chinese market has been closed. There's a self-inflicted, if I could call it that way, uh, self-closure, zero COVID policy that was uh, placed by the Ch Chinese government on the entire market. I don't need to explain to you how hard it was for internal market, but, but also for investors, for the business activities, for all of us that want to do uh, business uh, with China. And on top of that, um, on 8th of January, the Chinese government decided to reopen uh, the country to international trade, to visits, to, um, to travels, to all kinds of activities that make business ticking. So this, this collision of dates and the reason that we are meeting today is no coincidence at all. On top of that, I have to also highlight that the diplomatic forces of 11 countries globally also opened up with its letter on 21st of January, a discussion on governmental level to make sure that the Chinese authorities responsible for our uh, slice of the, uh, of the market for cosmetics do understand obstacles that we are all facing in terms of regulatory regimes being different. And it has to be highlighted and you all aware of that, that Chinese uh, regulation 
uh, doesn't copy, it's not identical, doesn't follow any other regulatory regimes which are known to us, I'm talking about cosmetic product regulation or American uh, cosmetic regulation system where you, we have cosmetics part and OTC or Japanese or any other. And for that reason, this what we will be discussing today is essential because we will present to you, thanks to the knowledge of our experts, what's in the current uh, regulatory Chinese regime, how do we need to prepare to be ready to re-enter this, this market? And we have to also remember that if we were present at the uh, e-commerce schemes sell selling our cosmetics to China, there are certain differences that we have to uh, follow. And of course, we will be talking about the registration processes. We will be talking about raw material submission code because you wanted to, to, to hear that. We will be also talking about still existing animal uh, testing obligations for special use cosmetics. This is something that we eagerly um, follow uh, and we try to understand. But we, we also need to stress that China reopening on 8th of January is probably the biggest economic event of 2023. And you as professionals, you as the people responsible in your companies for exports, for expansion of markets, you do need to follow, apart from regulatory uh, topics, you also need to follow the overall political and economic situation because this is really vital. As we know, and following all economic crises that we were observing since 70s, this is a, probably the most important moment because China opening will have, of course, a lot of positive and some negative effects that we have to be open about that. But China reopening in this shape, like today, will have an impact on us all and will bring a way of changes in terms of trade, will pick up uh, and will make us grow in terms of exports. So we need to follow that. We need to understand that. And of course, an important figure to understand the size of the cosmetic um, uh, industry market in China. China imports 21 billion um, US dollars worth of cosmetics from around the world. And this market cannot be uh, ignored. It cannot be close to us. Thank God it's reopening. We have to understand the potential of Chinese consumer who is hung hungry for the products that they used to buy during the closure. So a lot of moments to use this for our own advantage. But as we were ex exchanging the, the thoughts before coming live on, on Earth, on, on, uh, on, online, on website, you have to also remember that being uh, strict with regulatory regimes at home with cosmetic product regulation would only help you to find the differences, to find the spots where we have to fill in our product information file documentation or any other aspects of our own portfolio of products that we want to export to China. So huge momentum politically, economically, a lot of assets to use, opening of the Chinese economy, investments, new channels of being present there, new Chinese consumer ready to, to grasp the product, and you especially, uh, you entrepreneurs in Europe have to be uh, ready for this new opening and challenges and, uh, and, and new situations that I'm sure um, to open China experts will explain to you today. And we also want to tell you that there is a Q&A session, so please stay vigilant, listen, take notes, and use this time that we have together wisely to place all the questions you need the answers to, and um, have a wonderful two hours with us. I'm sure it will, it's, it's worth spending this time with us because it will only make our own situation in Europe easier. Please, I, don't, I don't, do not need to highlight that, but within the time when China was closed um, with zero COVID policy, a lot of things changed in Europe. Uh, we have a war on our uh, Eastern border. We have change of uh, export destinations, and this has to be taken into account as well. But ending on a positive note, 
thank you all of the allies which are around the screen now, around this table for the wonderful cooperation, for allowing us to talk to so many entrepreneurs today, uh, have a good um, webinar today. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very informative, very clear introduction. Uh, I believe it is uh, it has been extremely important to uh, to also have a recap of why the Chinese market is so important, what are the challenges that we're going to face, and why we should be focusing on these technical regulations. So without further ado, I would like to move to the main component uh, of this event and would like to leave the floor to Mr. Arby Tilner, who will be introducing us to the Chinese market of cosmetics. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the warm welcoming words and um, good morning to Europe. Good morning, uh, good afternoon to China. Um, my name is Arvid Tilner. I'm working with the USME Center and I'm trying to bring transparency into the regulatory framework that, um, for certain sectors. One of them is the cosmetic sector and my colleague and I, we have been writing or we wrote a report last year on the um, latest uh, changes uh, in the cosmetic sector, um, as Blanca already mentioned. Um, if you have any questions, uh, on the cosmetic sector or any others, you can um, either contact me through my email address or use the Ask the Expert function on our website. I linked it um, here on the screen. Um, you can really type any kind of questions and in a couple of days, we will come back to you and try to find a solution for you. Um, I will uh, introduce you today to one of the reports I have, or the report I have mentioned. I will just briefly mention some of these points because uh, Maria and her team will go into the details. Um, I just want to stress some of the highlights and some really important um, aspects of the report. And then I just want to mention short, briefly the self-diagnosis tool um, my colleague um, Davide already mentioned. Um, so the report provides an up-to-date uh, overview of the regulatory requirements that European uh, manufacturers of cosmetics must comply with um, to be able to export to China. So it's basically a, a um, how to um, guideline on how to deal with the registration process. Um, China's cosmetic sector is undergoing profound regulatory developments, uh, which are changing the way cosmetics products can be imported to, into China. The Cosmetic Supervision and Administration Regulation, uh, or short CSAR, came into effect on uh, the 1st of January, 2021. And it represents a new uh, overreaching cosmetic regulation um, or regulatory framework in China, covering many aspects, um, coming from the cosmetics classification, the product um, notification or registration, um, new ingredients management, efficacy evaluation, safety assessment, and many more. Um, simultaneously, since the 1st of January 2021, a new long-awaited milestone came into force, the possibility to, um, or, or for imported general cosmetics to be exempted from the mandatory animal exemption or testing um, in China. And this way, it's opening up the Chinese market for many um, European cruelty-free brands, which previously used the cross-border e-commerce um, pathway or didn't export at all. Um, other regulations on many other specific regulatory aspects such as labeling, efficacy claims, and safety assessment have also been updated and issued or are currently being formulated. You can find our report on our website. I linked it um, here on this um, slide, but you can easily find it also on our website. Um, so very briefly, generally, cosmetics is subdivided into special and general, general cosmetics. This differenti differentiation is necessary to determine the registration or notification process. As special, as special cosmetics are subject to a higher risk management, um, they will have to conduct a full registration um, process, whereas the general cosmetics um, conduct a notification process. Um, please note that um, infants and children cosmetics are su subdivided into the same um, classifications, but are usually subject to stricter, 
stricter, stricter requirements. Um, here, you can see the registration notification procedure in general terms. You can see there are many steps involved and um, the ultimate goal is to receive basically a registration and notification number, which you have to add to your label. Um, you can see here an overview of the general steps, um, but you can also see um, that there are some um, differences in the notification registration process, although there's quite a lot of similarities. The One of the biggest differences is the time frame. Um, you can see for special cosmetics, it can take quite a long time, um, from half a year to a year um, until the registration process is completed. Um, it's quite a normal standard. Um, the report will mostly highlight the differences of these processes. And for instance, we we'll provide an overview of the registration dossier that you have to submit, or for example, mandatory um, testing requirements. I just brought you here a little snip from the um, report. You can see the efficacy claims um, that you can you know, claim and some um, testing requirements you have to comply with, for example, human trials or animal testings. Um, briefly, there are several standards involved into the um, regulation of the labeling requirements. Um, for now, I um, only want to highlight the fir first one, which is um, you know, a very general introduction to the labeling requirements for cosmetics. Um, in the report, there will be detailed remarks on what has to be mentioned on the label. I just brought you here a little example on how a label could look like. And I highlighted the, um, the registration number you will receive at the end, um, because this is part of the requirements you have to submit. Um, as Blanca already has mentioned, animal testing is quite a big topic. And um, there are a few ways to avoid animal testing um, requirements in China. I only want to highlight one in particular, which is the last one here, and um, also the latest update, the exception for overseas um, general cosmetics. Um, one of the requirements is to be eligible to accept um, uh, to is to provide a good manufacturing practices certificate from a um, yeah from an official agency. Um, the EUSME Center consulted with some with, with their member states um, and asked for the contact details of these official agencies, so EUSMEs can easily get in contact with with them and you know. Uh, get the process done. So I think this is one of the value added uh, highlights of the report that you can easily access um, these uh, information. Um, lastly, um, the, I want to just mention um, there are different pathways to enter the Chinese market, either general trade, which is the normal or usual way, let's, it, uh, let's put it like this, or cross-border e-commerce. And um, the report will highlight the advantages and disadvantages of each pathway. Um, I'm not talking about this right now, but just because um, it will be covered by um, Maria later. I just want to mention there will be a new report which will be published on Friday on cross-border e-commerce and how to open an e-store on these e-commerce platforms. And we also will have a webinar at the 15th of um, March so if someone is, uh, in the audience is interested in cross-border e-commerce and wants to learn more about that, we are happy to invite you to join our webinar. So um, lastly, I just want to briefly mention the self-diagnosis tool we have uh, implemented recently. Um, you can basically test your readiness um, to enter the market. Um, like you do answer a few questions and um, this way we will see, uh, see where are may maybe some gaps uh, in knowledge. Um, and with these gaps, we can suggest you some content um, that will help you to, you know, to level these uh, gaps out. Um, you can also, if you have any questions after these, um, after you conducted the tool, um, you can always get a private consultation with us and ask, um, yeah, for 
close uh, for more precise answers. And you know, the self diagnosis tool covers different aspects like how to export to China, um, the regulatory environment, um, how to uh, you know, uh, how to know your Chinese partner, HR, or food and beverages. These are the current um, this is, this is the current status. So if you're interested in this, please follow the link I shared here. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will give the stage now to Maria and her team to give you some more detailed information about the whole registration process. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Arvid, uh, for this uh, for this introduction to the market. Uh, I would like now to move to the more technical part, if we may. Uh, so I believe that uh, in order to do so, the first person in line is uh, Miss Jun Huang from uh, to open. Yeah, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's me. I'm going to start. I'm going to share my screen. That's okay now. So, uh, dear participants, uh, welcome to this webinar dedicated to exporting cosmetics to China. It is a pleasure to share with you the answers to some certain questions and some key topics related to cosmetic in China. We are a Sino-European team located in Spain and in France and in Shanghai in, and in Weihai. Chuopin is a company specializing in digital marketing in China with an expert team dedicated to compliance. Cross-border e-commerce is the best pathway to test the potential of a product and develop an important market. But what once achieved to move on domestic platforms or the traditional offline market can lead to failure if regulatory requirements had not been integrated within development strategy. On today's agenda, the contents that we are going to discuss are product compliance, ingredient safety information submission, dual use ingredients license, efficacy claims and labeling requirements, animal testing, and last but not least, cross-border e-commerce panorama. Regarding the product compliance, it seems important to us to highlight who is in charge, what has been defined, and which are the, ma the mandatory requirements. We are going to move on regulatory bodies, definition, product classification, notification versus registration, new cosmetic ingredients, and market vigilance. The State Administration for Market Supervision is a Chinese authority directly under, under the State Council that deals with market competition, monopolies, intellectual property, and patents, as well as drug safety. Created in the course of a reform of the Chinese authorities in 2018, has united, united previously independent authorities. For example, the SAMR now oversees quality control, inspection and quarantine, uh, drug and food safety, and trade and industry. They manage all manner of market controls, focus on reinforced market supervision and social management to achieve better public service and environment, environmental protection. Uh, since the SAMR also carry out the registration of companies, it is often the first point of contact for foreign investors. Due to the unification of formerly separated authorities, SAMR pursues the goal of one-stop service for foreign investors with one contact for various processes. New regulation, cosmetic supervision and administration regulation, has been defined by the National Medical Product Administration. The certification and accreditation administration of China and the standardization administration of China remain independent, but are still subordinated to the SAMR administrative structure. In this slide, we show you the main regulatory tests and their dates if of entry into, into force. Now, Jung is going to comment on certain important points detailed in these sub-regulations. Jung? Hello, I'm June from Tilpen. It's a pleasure to share with you some ideas about Chinese cosmetic 
compliance. Let's continue with the first part, the definition and classification of cosmetics in China. A cosmetic product in China is a daily chemical product intended to be applied on the external part of human body, such as skin, nails, lips, by spreading, spraying, or other similar ways for cleansing, protecting, beautifying, or grooming purposes. It can be classified in two different types. One is the special cosmetics, which include the five plus one subcategories, namely hair dyes, hair perming, freckle removing, sun strains, anti-hair loss, and products with new efficacy. And within the scope of cosmetics for those other than the special cosmetics are general cosmetics. Toothpaste is under the administration of general cosmetics by CSAR. Soaps are not applicable to these regulations, but CSAR is applicable to those claiming to have special efficacy effects. For example, whitening soap. Cosmetics should select the corresponding serial numbers in order according to the classification catalogs. Appendix one to five attached to the cosmetic classification rules and catalogs involving the catalog of application zones, efficacy claims, target users, product dosage forms, and using methods and using hyphen between the catalog codes of each group connecting to form a complete product classification code. Here is an example in the right corner of this slide, the classification code of an anti-wrinkle cream for adult should be 15, 05, 03, 01, 02. Now let's check the China market access requirements. It's worth noting that the overseas registrant or notifier for imported cosmetics should designate a domestic responsible person in China mainland. It's a legal entity within the territory to handle and assist with the notification or registration process and cooperate with authorities on behalf of the overseas products manufactured. In the two charts below, you could have an overview about the procedures to notify or register your product in China. The submission of concerned information prior to placing the product on the market must be done through the NMPA website. In this slide, we have mentioned the documents to be submitted for brand application. Mandatory account opening with relevant information about the brand are including the following several documents. Registrant or notifier information form, domestic responsible person information form, the authorization letter of responsible person and notarial certificate. Resume of the person in charge of quality and safety. Quality management system overview of registrant or notifier. Adverse reaction monitoring and evaluation system overview form of registrant or notifier. Product enterprise information form. Then the certification documents of overseas manufacturing practices. Now we are going to know more about product documentation requirements, which include information form and related documents, free sales certificate, product name information, product formula, product executive standards, product label sample manuscript, product safety assessment documents, product testing report, Especially the safety assessment and the notification or registration related documentation are key topics to comply with Chinese regulation. From now on, we are going to take a deep look into ingredient compliance in China. 
The use of cosmetic ingredients is established in different regulatory texts. The inventory of existing cosmetic ingredients in China, i.e. CIC, and the safety and technical standards for cosmetics, STSC, in particular. Safety and technical standards for cosmetics 2022, which is still a draft, is overarching technical standard for cosmetic safety supervision and testing in China. It contains the prohibited, restricted, and permitted cosmetic ingredients, physical and chemical testing methods for cosmetics, microbiological testing methods, toxicological testing methods, human body safety testing methods, and human body efficacy evaluation testing methods. Currently, China mainly adopt eight ingredient lists to regulate the safety of cosmetics ingredients, which can be divided into three categories. Existing ingredients, prohibited ingredients, and permitted ingredients. Ingredients in the prohibited list cannot be allowed to use for production and sale of cosmetics. Ingredients in the permitted list are allowed to be used in cosmetics provided that the specified use conditions are met. As we know, it's important to well evaluate the situation of a product from a composition point of view. For example, one kind of urine filter showing a maximum concentration of 10% in the IECIC is allowed only until 0.5% for a general cosmetics, until 10% for a special cosmetics in STSC. An ingredient excluded from the IECIC is considered as a new ingredient thus cannot be used and shall undergo a notification or registration. New cosmetic ingredients is a natural or artificial ingredient used for cosmetics and entering the Chinese market for the first time. Depending on its risk, uh, there are two occurrence, high risk and low risk new cosmetics ingredient. Preservative, sun production, coloring, hair dyeing, freckle removing, and whitening, those belong to high risk, must be registered through NMPA. Others not falling within this scope of high risk new ingredients is under notification. The notification or registration process of new cosmetic ingredient is very similar to the products, which includes appointing a Chinese responsible person, account application, testing, and other needed information collection and submission. It will be approved after once submitting the materials in accordance with the requirements of NMPA. Referring to the new ingredients, different situations, the following documentation should be submitted accordingly. There are basic information of registrant or notifier and Chinese responsible person, technical requirements, research reports, quality control standards, safety assessment data, and other materials. Once the new cosmetics ingredient has been successfully approved the registration and or notification, there is a monitoring period for three years from the date when a cosmetics using the new co ingredient are notified or registered for the first time. The registrant notifier or Chinese responsible person of a new cosmetics ingredient shall submit an annual safety monitoring report to NMPA within 30 working days before the expiration of the annual safety monitoring period. 
since the implementation of the new regulations, 53 new ingredient cosmetic ingredients have been notified and all of them are currently in the monitoring period. Cosmetic adverse reactions is also worth noting. It generally refers to the adverse reactions of the skin and organs caused by the use of cosmetics in people's daily life because of cosmetic itself or individual specificity. Non-serious adverse reaction is not specified within the regulation. Serious cosmetic adverse reaction refers to the large area or deep serious damage to the skin and its appendages caused by cosmetics, as well as serious systematic damage to other tissues or organs. There are many five categories we have shown on this slide. For further detailed information, Diagnostic criteria and treatment principles for cosmetic skin diseases is suggested to refer to. Consumers' reports on adverse reactions are important sources of information and are crucial to accurately judging consumers' allergies to certain cosmetic ingredients or timely discovering products with quality and safety problems. It can judge the completeness, accuracy, and usefulness of adverse reaction reports, laying a solid foundation for later data analysis and utilization. To identify the quality and safety risks of cosmetics, and to guide the regulatory authorities to further strengthen the safety supervision of cosmetics. The reporter is responsible to consolidate and report information on adverse reactions, namely symptoms or signs, severity of adverse reactions, date of occurrence of adverse reactions, date of discovery or knowing of adverse reactions, date of adverse reaction reported, names of cosmetics product used. For serious adverse reaction and likely to cause greater social impact, also record the possible causes of adverse reactions, analysis and evaluation, and follow up risk control measures. Medical institutions are responsible for diagnosis and treatment related to cosmetic adverse reactions. There are some information needed, such as registration or notification certification number, production batch number, using period, diagnosis, and treatment. How to comply with the post-marketing surveillance from the brand's point of view? We need to have the monitoring and reporting adverse reactions of cosmetics and safety use of new cosmetic ingredients. We need to do the record implementation. We need to bear corresponding quality and safety responsibilities for cosmetics and new cosmetic ingredients. We need also to cooperate with inspection work of the medical supervision and management department. Last but not least, we need to upload quality and adverse reaction annual reports. Regarding the safety, uh, the ingredient safety information that must be submitted before May 1st, for all the ingredients used in China, uh, we are going to share some uh, updates. On July uh, 28, uh, last year, the Department of Cosmetic Regulation of National Medical Products Administration convened provisional, prov Provincial Medical Product Administration, National Institutes for Food and Drug Control, 
NMPA Information Center, and China Association of Fragrance, Flavor, and Cosmetic Industry, holding a video symposium with industry association. Based on the industry opinions collected before, NMPA has analyzed the situation and clarified some matters that the industry is concerned about. The purpose of ingredient safety information submission is to track and monitor problematic ingredients and product containing them, express the necessity to reinforce the information security management of the submission platform, and emphasize the responsibilities of registrants and notifiers. To declare safety information for raw material containing ingredients already listed in the inventory, several, several options are possible. The raw material manufacturer completes the information on his ingredient raw material on the authority's raw material platform to obtain a submission number and transmit it to his client. If the raw material manufacturer does not carry out the notification, he must send Annex 13 and Annex 14 to the manufacturer of cosmetic products who can register the finished product by attaching both annexes. The raw material manufacturer can give an exclusive mandate to one of his customers, cosmetic product manufacturer, or his distributor or a third party to carry out the notification on the NMPA portal in his name and on his behalf. Obligation to have a writing and contractual agreement. The raw material manufacturer must transmit all the information about the raw material in order to enable notification. The raw material will obtain a codification number which must be shared to all customers. When all elements are filled, uh, an ingredient code is automatically generated. 15 digits format, six digits identification of the ingredient, five digits identification of the manufacturer, four digits identification of the specification. Part of the ingredient code and the inky name are made public by the authorities. Annex, 14, uh, annex, uh, annex uh, 13 refers to general information about the enterprise and certification documents. The authorization letter issued by the ingredient manufacturer is mandatory. Information in Annex 14 is related to the ingredients, trade name, basic information, composition, inky names and percentage, organoleptic and physicochemical characteristic, description of the production process, quality controls and methods, trace, traces of hazardous substances, heavy metals, pesticides, etc. International cosmetic regulation in relation to this ingredient with possible restriction, maximum recommended cosmetic concentration, possible mandatory labeling, and other special requirements depending on the raw material composition. In this slide, we show you an example of the information collected in Annex 14, composition, recommended, recommended dosage in cosmetics, restrictions, properties, and manufacturing process, described in a brief and clear format, as in this example. A new function has recently been announced regarding the possibility to proceed with an update instead of declaring a gain. If manufacturer has changed or quality or safety, safety information must be updated or complete, uh, an update of raw material information through this new function is enough. Now comes to the dual use ingredients part. It was a hot topic last summer. According to the regulations of the General Administration of Customs of China, Cosmetics containing triethanolamine can only be imported to China after obtaining the import license for dual use items and technologies, no matter through general trade or cross border e commerce. TEA is often used as emulsifier, humectant, humidifier, thickener, and pH adjuster which is possible to be used as a main ingredient for the production of chemical weapons belong to category three, 
monitored and controlled chemicals. If you need to apply for a dual use certificate for your cosmetics import, please notice there are only two designated units can operate. The obtaining of a dual use certificate is around one and a half months for the whole application process, which validity period is one year. On October 28th, 2022, the General Administration of Customs of China issued a letter clarifying the a new supervision requirement for TA exemption. TA, which acts as a pH regulator in cosmetics, detergents, and other commodities, will generally neutralize the acidic substances. If the test report issued by relevant testing agencies shows that TA monomers cannot be detected, it proves that TA has been fully reacted and there is no free TA. In such circumstances, products can be exempted from the verification of the import and export license for dual use items and technologies by virtue of the testing report. Another important topic is about efficacy claims and labeling requirements. Cosmetic claims refer to the text, symbols, digits, patterns, and other marks on product sales packaging, which are used to identify and describe the product's basic information, attribute characteristic and safety warnings, uh, as well as the packaging containers, packaging boxes, and leaflets with mark information. All text must be indelible, easily legible, and visible lettering. Applies to all types of claims transmitted by any type of media. Ensures that, if, that the information transmitted to the consumer is useful, understandable, and reliable. Ensures a high level of protection for end users, especially against misleading claims. In the, proper, in the primary packaging, the Chinese name, the batch number, and the durability are mandatory. In the secondary packaging, information regarding the registrant or notifier, the Chinese responsible person, and the manufacturer must be indicated. Besides the Chinese name, the net content, and the product executive standard number, the list of ingredients, the way of use, the safety warnings, the batch number, and the durability must be included on the labeling. For cosmetic intended for children, NMPA mark and warning are mandatory. Cosmetics registrant and notifier shall upload an abstract for the basis of product efficacy claims evaluation during documents submission process. You may choose different testing methods according to the efficacy claims. Please pay attention that the first three claims human trials need to be done only in China accredited lab. The register or notifier need to upload a summary of the basis for the product efficacy claim through NMPA platform. Then every user can get close to the information about the testing reports of efficacy. Here, we're showing you an example visible on NMPA website from an European brand product and how they have described moisturizing, soothing, and other efficacy claims tested. Before finishing with the contents related to the regulation in China, let's clarify briefly when we can avoid animal testing. General cosmetics are exempted from animal testing except infant and children cosmetics, cosmetic using new ingredients during the monitoring period, cosmetic whose notifier, responsible person, or manufacturer is listed as a key supervision target by an MPA. And the requirements uh, are the GMP certified by the government of the country of manufacturing and the safety assessment report that can fully confirm product safety. 
uh, one question that I saw uh, within the, the chat is uh, if uh, SGS or Intertech or another GMP certificate is valid in China, yes, it's valid, but not to avoid animal testing. Regarding, regarding cosmetic ingredient safety assessment, the documentation needed is the abstract, ingredient physical and chemical properties, safety assessment process, risk control measures or recommendation, conclusion of safety assessment, signature and resume of the safety assessor, the references, and the annexes. To complete the cosmetic product safety assessment, the documentation needed is the abstract, product introduction, product formula, formula design principles only for children cosmetics, safety assessment of each ingredient in the formula, assessment of possible risk substances, risk control measures or recommendation, safety assessment conclusions, at variation records, signature and resume of the safety assessor and references. We finish this presentation with some notions of the necessary requirements to market the product in cross-border e-commerce, always keeping in mind that the compliance in the country of origin must be warranty. Luis, okay. please. Well, thank you very much. So uh, you keep sharing, no, Maria? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. And we're gonna go very fast through the topic of cross-border e-commerce. There is gonna be a, a specific session on cross-border e-commerce organized by USME. Uh, soon, okay. Um, I would like to mention uh, mainly that it is possible to sell some cosmetics in China uh, through cross-border e-commerce. What means uh, that the seller and the owner of the shop, the owner of the products, and the owner of the money involved, it's a foreign entity, and uh, it doesn't involve the registration of the products in China, as we have just seen that, that we have seen that uh, it's. Uh, it might be costly in efforts, okay? Um, so that allows a company that didn't register a product into the market to sell directly to Chinese consumers with a warehouse in the in a free trade in China and with a trademark even out of China, although it's very suggested to have a trademark inside China. So this, no, no, uh, today, it is feasible to, to sell in cross-border e-commerce. So <clears throat> what is the difference between cross-border e-commerce and domestic e-commerce? The main difference. The main difference is that in domestic e-commerce, the seller is inside China and the importation process happens before the end transaction to the last consumer. In the cross-border e-commerce, the seller is out of China and the importation process happens at the moment the B2C transaction is uh, taking place. And it also changes uh, some responsibility. For example, in the domestic e-commerce, the tariff and the VAT are paid in the importation process. In the cross-border e-commerce, there is no tariff and VAT. There is another tax, which is called in different ways, but sometimes it's called postal tax. And this tax can be different. Uh, it depends on the product categories, and it depends on the good is considered luxury or not, around 9.1%, although this has been changing through the time. There is a positive list. So there is a list of products that can be sold through cross-border e-commerce. There is no need to adapt the packaging. Um, as we said, the importer is the final consumer. So this is a, is a very big advantage. The products should go to a bonded area normally, is the normal way to, of doing it, and the Chinese consumers directly buy from the cross-border e-commerce supplier. So the products that normally can be sold through uh, and are in the positive list and that normally are selling good is personal care and cosmetics, watches and jewelry, some food and health. Normally we're talking about things with added value and a small volume, uh, some electronic and appliance and some mother and baby products. So these are the top selling products. And um, normally uh, there are many, very a lot of places right now where cross-border e-commerce can, be, uh, can be done, okay? But it is true that the two main uh, e-commerce platforms are Timo Global and JD Worldwide. As, as we talk now, and it's already in the last days, a couple of weeks, uh, JD is changing the model from a model in which there is an annual fee 
my favorite reliable model. This is uh, the last news. This is happening now. In fact, this is being implemented. It's not just in place in all the shops. And uh, they are charging a commission of 2 to 8% with a deposit of 15,000 US dollars. And uh, here we have the cost also for Timor Global. So the structure of the charge is always the same. There is normally a deposit. This deposit is to warranty uh, sometimes some, some responsibilities and charges. There is an annual fee, which they want to make sure that the product we put to sell uh, uh, have some warranties, and there is the final value fee. And normally we don't have the, the, to register the products into the market, but we need to uh, make a kind of registration within the e-commerce platform some other kind of registration. And also I must say that in some cosmetics, let's say special cosmetics, if we do not have the registration, we are not allowed to advertise with different advertising formats that the platform has, okay? Okay, so um, we are having good volumes in cross-border e-commerce. It can be a good way to testing, but it doesn't, let's say, remove the validity on the importance of regulation. The Chinese government is very being very protective of the Chinese consumer. Um, that is the reason why to enter into the domestic, which is still is a bigger market, uh, has those requirements. But still, cross border can be a, a solution. Today, I just wanted to give some hints. There will be a session more uh, specifically dedicated to cross border e-commerce. Just today, the message is for you that it is feasible to sell without doing the registration of most products. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much to the entire two open team. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Jin. And I believe that we can now move to the Q&A session. As it was mentioned in the introductory remark, uh, this is a good opportunity in order to have uh, an important exchange with our experts on these topics. So in order to break the ice, I see that we have already received uh, some questions from uh, our participants. Please keep uh, keep writing uh, any questions that you, you might have. We will try our best to answer them all. And I would like to start from a very uh, specific question that uh, I would like to address to Maria as it was uh, uh, written during her presentation. And uh, one of our participants asks if the safety assessment report uh, does have to be in Chinese uh, or if the English language is also accepted. All the information must be in Chinese. We translate all the documentation that is relevant. We don't translate, translate the whole documentation we have, but the needed doc documentation to show when the, we have an inspection, we have a control, uh, when, uh, of course, we can communicate uh, in a clear way with uh, the inspector, and it's in Chinese. Okay. Thank so we prepare Thank all the much. documentation in order to, to be well received by our con contact in, in front of us, uh, and we prepare all, uh, we take uh, care to prepare all in Chinese, of course. Perfect, thank you. And then, uh, June, there was a question that was written also during your presentation. Uh, also here, it's very specific. Um, if uh, they are not considered as cosmetics, uh, under which category do some products end, end up, such as soap, bar, liquid, hand face wash, uh, etc.? So no matter uh, what kind of uh, category is the soap product, uh, most of them, even though soap bar, liquid hand, or fa face wash are not including here because for for facial cleansing, it's uh, considered as cosmetics. But most of the soap products are not cosmetics. And I have uh, showed an example about the whitening soap, but it's actually very hard to have this kind of efficacy claims when you're a soap because you wash it after you use it. So we can consider that or soap products are not considered cosmetics. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that we have a couple of questions concerning uh, CBEC. So uh, I would like to start from the most straightforward one. Uh, we're asked if uh, CBEC also needs a reg registration of trademark in China. And linked to that, uh, we might try and answer two questions in one. Uh, we have a specific request related to triethylamine uh, import through the CBEC. Uh, 
rather than getting too much technical into the specific uh, into the specific topic, uh, I believe it is relevant uh, if it would be possible to uh, experience some uh, cases uh, related to CBC import and if there are any solutions with problems related to specific ingredients. So uh, this is an, an open question. Uh, whoever wants to chip in is uh, is more than welcome to to do so. So I'd, I'd, I'd start from the component concerning the uh, registration of trademark in China. Uh, this might be uh, this might be a bit more straightforward to uh, to pick up. Luis. But, um, yeah, the, about the trademark registration, uh, no, for the cross-border e-commerce, it's not necessary to have a trademark registered in China. Uh, it is uh, very recommendable to have it. Um, it is always much better to have it, but uh, it can be done. Uh, an online shop in a cross-border e-commerce platform can be registered as long as you have the trademark register or in your home country or in the home country of the entity that is opening the, the cross-border e-commerce shop, but uh, there is no need to have the, the trademark register. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much, thank you very much. And then let's move uh, away a little bit from the cross-border e-commerce component. Uh, we also have uh, more of a technical uh, question concerning the information that cosmetic brands need uh, from manufacturer. Uh, we're asked if it is sufficient to have the ISC code, the trade name and the name of the manufacturer, or if there are other informations that are required. Uh, yes, uh, with the ISC code, uh, they are asking for the Annex 14 to join with the code in order to verify quality data. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, then also uh, staying on a bit more of a technical topic, uh, more of a, if you want to use the term bureaucratic, maybe uh, kind of issue. We are asked if uh, a free sales certificate issued by a national trade association will be accepted uh, as a valid document when exported to China. Jun, do you want to answer this one? Uh, June, you are muted. Yeah, of course. Uh, a free sale certificate issued by a national trade association can also be accepted only with uh, some, uh, how to say, accurate word. We can not using the word like assuming or it can uh, it considered to be, but we need to uh, confirm with the language that. Uh, this product is confirmed by the association that is setting on the um, country of origin, uh, something like that, a very accurate word. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I also take the chance to uh, point out that uh, under the chat has been linked uh, the web page of the China IPR help desk that uh, is uh, also a very uh, useful instrument and tool to support on uh, trademark registration and uh, IPR and IP protection. So uh, for your reference, there's also this uh, added, uh, added instrument that can be used when, uh, when exporting to China. And I see that we are receiving a relevant number of questions. I'm extremely happy about that. It means that uh, we, we picked your interest during the uh, during the uh, the event. So moving on with the uh, Q and A session, um, we are asked if the uh, cosmetic uh, ingredient notification needs to be made by a Chinese agent, or if it can be done as a distributor from Europe. This is a very uh, practical kind of uh, question that we're receiving. It can be done by the distributor. Um, uh, and it can be done by the brand here in Europe, but the only problem is that all the information must be shared in Chinese, within the Chinese platform. Once you handle Chinese here in Europe, wherever you can handle uh, with the submission uh, from here. 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Maria. And then we have a, a series of questions under the uh, category under which items fall. I believe that uh, June had already partially answered also to the, uh, we, we have received a question concerning under which category would an uh, intimate care uh, uh, product uh, end up. But if you want to add something a bit more under this category division, June, but uh, just if you want to add something, I believe it was, uh, sufficiently well uh, well responded already this kind of uh, component pardon me can you show me which uh question are you asking? which category oh, does intimate well. care live on product fall we 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 handle uh, a case uh, of an spanish company uh -huh. that uh, we were not able to handle uh, in china because uh, external genital organs are not included within Chinese cosmetic definition. Okay. Okay. So our uh, Chinese cosmetic definition is uh, smaller than the European one, and intimate uh, care live on products. We must uh, well analyze in order to really check if uh, we could uh, justify. Uh, under the definition of cosmetic in China. But in this application zone, external genital organs are not included in the Chinese definition. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Maria. And uh, another question. Uh, this is uh, very, uh, also very specific concerning Annex uh, for, uh, 14. Uh, we are asked if the uh, this annex should be signed, should it be stamped? Uh, what are the uh, technical, let's say, bureaucratic components that should be followed for this annex? If the raw material supplier uh, have obtained the ingredient submission code uh, with the information of the uh, in the annex fourteen, it's enough. If the raw material supplier uh, uh, didn't. Uh, submitting the information and you only have annex, annex 13 and annex 14, yes, please, it must be signed and stamp it. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I would uh, also like to, uh, to point out that uh, we might not be able to answer all of, the, uh, all of the questions that we are receiving today. At the end of the presentation, I will also uh, share my email address so that you can uh, direct them uh, to us and that we can try and provide answer as a follow-up to this uh, to this event so uh, do not worry if we did not did not pick your your question during this uh, uh, during this moment all uh, all of these interactions are extremely important for us as well so we will try our best to to provide a reply uh, after we we finish this event uh, to this end, I would say that we can pick up a couple final questions and then uh, move on towards the uh, closure of the of the event. I see that we uh, keep on receiving new questions. This is uh, I, I'm very happy of that. And so let's go with the last one that we've uh, that we've received. Uh, we're asked if it is possible uh, to market a product under co-branding in China. Uh, I'm not sure if. Um, uh, if this is a, a question that uh, any of you would like uh, would, would like to pick up, uh, as it has no, uh, let's say, specific technical components to to answer. Otherwise, we can just move to to a different question. I'd say then, uh, for example, we move to the question right above. <laughs> we are asked if there's a cost to notify or register ingredients in uh, an MPA, or is it if, or if it is free of charge? Uh, when we are saying notify or register ingredients, I guess we are speaking about new cosmetic ingredients. We notify a new cosmetic ingredient if it is a low risk ingredient. We register a new cosmetic ingredient when it is a high risk uh, uh, preservative, uh, uh, UV filter, uh, coloring agent, or hair dye. Uh, of course, there is a cost. Uh, there is, uh, if it is a uh, uh, high risk ingredient, we need a huge quantity of testing done uh, with the ingredient uh, here in whatever we want in Europe or in a foreign country uh, outside China. Some of them must be done in China, some specific. 
regarding a specific, a specific uh, efficacies that we want to link with ingredients. But uh, yes, it's a cost. Uh, Notify is uh, less expensive. Register it more expensive, of, co of course, because the documentation and the tested uh, needed. It's not for free. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much. Extremely clear. Uh, I would say that uh, we can bring uh, close to the uh, Q&A session. And uh, prior to uh, ending the, uh, the webinar, I would like to leave the floor to Mr. Christoph Florczek from the uh, Polish Embassy for a, a short comment. Thank you. Thank you, Davide. Uh, thank you for the honor uh, to have some final words today. Uh, so I think it was a great opportunity to exchange uh, some knowledge. Uh, I would like to especially thank to USME Center, also Polish Investment and Trade Agency, uh, Polish uh, Union of Cosmetics uh, Industry, and of course our uh, expert from uh, to open. So in my final words, uh, I would like to uh, highly recommend to cooperate with the USME Center. Uh, in such a complex market as China, uh, you cannot afford to, to not contact uh, uh, European institutions. Uh, so uh, USME Center is definitely the, the first address uh, to uh, ask uh, questions about the uh, uh, market. And also try, try if you are uh, ready for this market. Uh, another institution is IPR, uh, IPR Help Desk. And you can find uh, information about trademarks uh, and basically IP uh, IP laws in China, which are completely different uh, than what we uh, have in Europe. It's a completely different system. And um, if, uh, as a European company, you, have, you are having uh, any problems, issues. Uh, with Chinese administrations, uh, please do not uh, hesitate to contact uh, uh, your embassy, uh, Polish embassy, in case of uh, Polish uh, enterprises. We're really looking forward uh, for your feedback, uh, how the registration process uh, uh, is going. And uh, if we don't have uh, this feedback, this knowledge about uh, problems you are, you are having, uh, we are not able to to help, uh, and then uh, when it comes to the G2G contacts, uh, this knowledge is also very useful for us uh, to, to to raise awareness that uh, we are this is very important for for us. Uh, so uh, after the three years of uh, zero COVID, China is now open. So I'm looking forward uh, to see uh, many companies, uh, many new friends coming to China. Uh, so uh, thank you again and uh, see you soon I hope thank you very much thank you very much uh, Christophe and before ending the uh, the webinar I would like first of all to once again uh, say thank you to all the panelists it has been uh, it has been extremely uh, interesting the uh, the event per se the uh, Q&A session uh, it has been very uh, very important to share this uh, this information with SMEs that want to enter the Chinese market uh, thank you as well to all the participants. I'm aware that uh, we didn't have the time to answer all of your uh, all of your questions, unfortunately. To this end, please uh, reach out to me at davide.orlandi at usmecenter.org.cn and I will try my best to uh, put you in contact with uh, either the speaker or our experts in order to uh, have your uh, questions answered. Uh, after uh, after this event, uh, I would also uh, kindly like to ask you to please fill out the post attendee survey that will be available uh, on the platform as soon as this event will be closed. Uh, your feedback is extremely important for us at, uh, as it is allows to ameliorate uh, future conferences that we might have. So in conclusion, once again, thank you very much to all of you. It was a pleasure and hopefully we'll have the chance to meet again soon. Thank you very much.